Hello. In this lesson, we begin chapter four, functional limits and continuity. We'll cover two sections. 4.1 is just a basic introduction to uh, some crazy examples, the examples of Dirichlet and Tomei. And then 4.2, the real definitions start hitting us, and we'll see exactly what it means for the limit of a function to equal L. All right, let's begin. So let's recall our basic calculus one definition of continuity at a point. Only one of these functions is continuous at three. I bet you can tell which one it is. The first one, f of three does not exist, but uh, the limit as x approaches three equals two. In the second case, f of three does exist, but the limit does not exist. In the third case, f of three equals three. Uh, the limit as x approaches three looks like it is two. And in the last case, something magic happens. Uh, f of three is two, and the limit as x goes to three of f of x is two. They match, and that's exactly what we need for continuity at a point. So the function is continuous when the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals f of c. So let's take a look at some strange examples. The first one is the Dirichlet function. g of x equals 1 if x is taken from the rationals and 0 if x is taken from the irrationals. So here's 1, there's 0, and every time, I, every time my x value is rational, the value is up here at 1. Every time it's irrational, the value is down there at 0. So let's suppose that I have a sequence of x's that approaches zero where all those x's are rational. Well then all of the function values will be one and so the limit of one, 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 one is simply one. If my x's approach zero where my x's are irrational, then the function values there are all zero. And so the limit as n goes to infinity of something that is constantly zero is of course zero. The limit of this function as x goes to zero does not exist. Here's a modified version of the function. Again, if I put in an irrational into the function, I get zero. But if I put in a rational, it just spits back the same rational I plugged in. So f of 2 thirds, for example, equals 2 thirds. Well, something interesting is going on right around x equals zero. If xn is any sequence that converges to zero, then what's going to happen is that the limit as n goes to infinity of h of x of n is itself zero. But in fact, h of zero equals zero, and the limit as x goes to zero of h of x equals zero. These two match. So just like we had in the previous slide, it's continuous. h of x is continuous at x equals zero. Is this function continuous anywhere else? No, it is not. Weirdly, this modified Dirichlet function is continuous at exactly one point, namely zero. As our third weird example, consider Tomei's function. The idea is that if I plug in a rational number, if I plug in a rational number in lowest terms, then the answer I get out is one over that denominator. So for example, t of two-thirds equals one-third. t of five-sevenths equals one-seventh. t of nine-seventy-firsts equals one-seventy-first. Oh, but if I plug in an irrational number, I get out zero. So t of pi equals zero. And this is what the function kind of looks like a little bit. I have a higher resolution picture on the next slide looks something like that, kind of cool. Is this function, is Tomei's function continuous at any rational number? The answer is no. You can take a second to convince yourself of that. Is this function continuous at any irrational number? And yes, and in fact, all of them. At any irrational number, this function is continuous. Kind of a weird thing, right? It's not continuous at any rational number, and it is continuous at any irrational number. All right, so those are three weird examples of functions. We'll start 4.2 now and begin a serious study of the limits of functions. So, we have a function. 
let's consider the function f with domain a that maps into the real numbers. I'm going to express my domain and codomain as two number lines. So I might have some points in my domain that get mapped onto points in my codomain. They don't have to go in order. If I have x1, x2, x3, these will get mapped onto f of x1 and f of x2 and f of x3. What does it mean to say that the limit as x goes to c of f of x equals l? Well, I have a point c that is a limit point of a. c doesn't have to be in a, but it is a limit point of a, which means that I can get arbitrarily close to it with points of a. So c is a limit point of a, and l is a value in my real numbers. And that limit expression means that if we are given any epsilon greater than 0, and I put my epsilon in the reals, I put my epsilon around L, then there exists some delta greater than zero, and I'm going to put my delta around C, such that whenever X is in the delta neighborhood around C, whenever X is in the delta neighborhood around C, it must be the case that F of X is in the epsilon neighborhood around L. So I plug in points around C within delta of C and I should get out function values that are all within epsilon of L. If I can do that then that's what it means for that limit to exist. Oh, One fine point here is that I don't require in fact I don't even want my x to equal C. I just let x approach c. We don't know that c is in the domain of the function. Here's the official definition, just to put it in words concisely. Let f be a function from a to the reals, and let c be a limit point of a. We say that the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l, provided that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists some delta greater than 0 such that 0 less than absolute value of x minus c less than delta implies absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Thinking about this in terms of neighborhoods, we write x is in the delta neighborhood of c implies that f of x is in the epsilon neighborhood of l. And again, where x doesn't actually equal c. The fact that x doesn't actually equal c is also reflected in the other way of looking at it where I write that the absolute value of x minus c has to be greater than zero. Let's see how we use this definition to prove a couple limits. For example one, let's prove that if f of x equals 3x plus 1, then the limit as x goes to 2 of f of x really is 7. So I'm going to compare the two absolute value expressions and ask how are they related? Can I find an equation that relates the two? Now the f of x minus l part, that simplifies to 3x minus 6. And the x minus c part simplifies to x minus 2. I'll stop saying absolute value because it's a little cumbersome, but you can see what I mean, I hope. So the 3x minus 6 is 3 times the x minus 2. That's how they are algebraically related. So what conditions on that right-hand side make that less than epsilon? Well, if 3 times x minus 2 is less than epsilon, that happens when my x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 3. Ah, this absolute x minus 2, that's the thing we wanted less than delta. So now that I have the x minus 2 by itself, this tells me a good choice for delta. I should make my delta be the epsilon over 3. So now we can actually begin the proof proper. Let epsilon be given and let delta equal the epsilon over 3. Then, if x is within delta of 2, then absolute value of 3x minus 6 equals 3 absolute value of x minus 2. And what we saw earlier, now this x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 3. I get less than 3 times epsilon over 3, which is just epsilon. So absolute value 3x minus 6 is less than epsilon, as we needed. And that's the end of the proof.
Example 2. Prove that if f of x equals x squared, then the limit as x goes to 2 of f of x is 4. Again, we'll compare our two absolute value expressions. Can we find some way that they are related? The first absolute value expression is x squared minus 4. The other is absolute x minus 2. And those are very clearly related. Now, in the previous problem, this first factor was a constant. But in this example, it's not a constant. It's variable, which is going to make things a little trickier. But here's how we handle it. I want to find an upper bound on that. Even if I can't make it a, even if it's not exactly a constant itself, let's find an upper bound. And the trick is to require delta less than 1. Now, I'm going to make my delta small anyway by the end, so let's just at least require that it's at least smaller than 1. And that's going to give me the ability to put a bound on that first absolute value expression. If delta is less than 1, then that means that x is within 1 of 2. So x is between 1 and 3. Well, if x is between 1 and 3, what is the biggest value that absolute x minus 2 can be? Absolute value x minus 2 is now less than 3 plus 2, which is 5. So this expression is actually less than 5. You know, again, as long as I'm setting ahead that delta is definitely less than 1. OK, so here we go. Absolute value x squared minus 4 is less than 5 absolute value of x minus 2, because I know that delta is less than 1. Now let's take this expression. Can I make that thing less than epsilon? We're kind of now on the same path that I was in example 1. 5 times x minus 2 is less than epsilon when x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 5. And that gives me the clue for how to set my delta. So let epsilon be given and let delta be, so here's our little trick, the minimum of 1 and epsilon over 5. So when x is within delta of 2, we find that here's our equality that's due simply to algebra. And then I can throw a 5 in there because delta is less than 1. And then I can throw the epsilon over 5 in there because my x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 5. And that whole thing equals to 5. So under these conditions, we find that the absolute value of x squared minus 4 is less than epsilon. And that's what I needed. And that concludes the second example. The sequential criterion for functional limits is a nice alternate way of using a limit instead of the definition. It's a theorem that's equivalent to the definition. Given a function f that goes from a to the reals and a limit point c of a, the following two statements are equivalent, if and only if. So the limit as x goes to c, f of x equals l, if and only if, for all sequences where the sequence values are taken from a, where the sequence elements are not c, and where the sequence converges to c, it follows that the sequence of function values converges to L. Let me make an emphasis on the word all, for all sequences. Now this is if and only if. So the first part says that if that limit works, then all sequences have this property. And the only if part says if all sequences have this property, then the limit exists. Graphically, the idea is something we've seen before. I have a sequence, and in my domain, the sequence values are approaching C. And what this tells me is that for any sequence that I write, where as long as those values are approaching C, the values in my codomain are also going to approach L. So the proof is in the book. It's not a difficult proof. It's a little longer than I want to get into here. But at least what I can do now is a corollary, an immediate consequence of this theorem. And that is the algebraic limit theorem for functional limits. Suppose f is a function from a to the reals, g is a function from a to the reals, and let c be a limit point of a. Also, let's imagine that the limit as x goes to c of f of x is l and the limit as x goes to c of g of x is m. Then some nice algebraic results follow. There's the constant rule 
The limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. The limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits, provided that that limit on the bottom isn't zero. The proofs of these four results follow from the algebraic limit theorem for sequences and from the sequential criterion for functional limits. In the homework problems, you're going to be asked to prove number two. On the next slide, let me go through a proof of number one. So why is this theorem true? Okay, so we're going to use the sequential criterion for functional limits. So I put it up to the side there just to remind us. By hypothesis, that is the hypothesis for our algebraic limit theorem, by hypothesis, the limit as x goes to c of f of x is l. Well, that's also the hypothesis for the sequential criterion. So I can, <laughs> I can use my sequential criterion immediately to say that the second part is true. So by the sequential criterion for functional limits in the forward direction, this implies that for all sequences xn where the values are taken from a, as long as that those values aren't c and where the sequence converges to c, we must have that the sequence of function values approaches L. But this last thing, this sequence of function values, that is a sequential limit. It's just a limit of, of points. It's a limit of, of numbers. So we can apply our algebraic limit theorem for sequences that we saw a while back. And so what changes is that I know that I can multiply that uh, those function values by a constant k and the result will also be multiplied by a constant k as well. All the other language is the same. For all sequences, as long as the values are taken from a, they don't equal c, and the sequence approaches c, we know that k times f of n approaches k times l. Now I can use the sequential criterion for functional limits in the reverse direction. And I know that this implies that the limit as x goes to c of k times f of x equals k times l for all real numbers k. And that's it. So the idea is we use the forward direction to turn our statement about limits into a statement about sequences. I use the algebraic limit theorem to convert it and then I can go back here is a divergence criterion for functional limits. What kind of a test can we do to conclude that a limit just doesn't exist? Basically, this is the sequential criterion negated. We're going to look for two different sequences, x sub n and y sub n, where they go to the same limit. So x sub n approaches a number c and y sub n approaches a number c. And the function limit of the x's isn't the function limit of the y's. And the corollary says, if you can find two such sequences, then the limit as x goes to c of my function does not exist. We actually saw this earlier with the Dirichlet function. Let's suppose that um, we pick the number 5. So I'll write down a 5 there. There's 0, there's 1, and we'll say that my x's approach 5 with x's rational. So maybe I have a bunch of rational numbers that are all approaching 5. And my y's approach 5 with y irrational. So maybe my y's approach 5, and, all the, and those are all irrational numbers. What do the function values look like? Well, with the rational numbers, my function values are all going to be constantly 1. And with my irrationals, the function values are all constantly 0. So the limit of g of the x's ends up being 1, but the limit of g using the y's ends up being 0. Those don't match, and so the limit as x goes to <laughs> 7, how about 5? The limit as x goes to 5 of g of x does not exist. All right, how about the homework? 4.2, 1a, 2, 3, 5ac, 6, 8a. It looks like a lot, but they're not too bad. Let me make a little remark here. 8a, use the divergence 
criterion that we just talked about a few seconds ago. The trickiest one, but I'll also say the most interesting one, is going to be 3. The idea is, if you look at Tomei's function, it just looks like the limit as x approaches 1 of Tomei's function equals, what do you think? equals 0. It looks like that's true. And you'll be asked to do some examples that kind of confirm that, and then to actually prove this using our definition of the limit. It's not too bad, but uh, kind of interesting, and it does make you think a little bit and makes you appreciate kind of the, the weirdness of Tomei's function. All right, get to it, and good luck.